welcome you all to Trek Wars. All right, let's talk about the Galaxy class and its role during the Dominion War and how it was used and what its operational specs are. Now, we're not going to do a full deep dive on every part of the Galaxy class. Understand that the Galaxy class was a multi-role vessel and it was full of extremely advanced components, parts, labs, and etc. It's much more than just a fighting ship. But with that being said, it was very capable in combat and it had a very important role during the Dominion War. So if you have a fleet of Galaxy classes, my thought is that you would not put them in, would say, wings of Galaxy classes. You would want to split them up because they are such a valuable asset. Putting them all together in just one spot is just asking for the enemy to target them out and wipe them out. And you're losing one of the most valuable pieces of your military you could have. So of all the great assets this ship has, it has really advanced ECM technology. Fantastic sensors. But it also has really strong, robust, powerful shielding it's one of the best things about a galaxy class starship is the fact it can take a heavy beating and it can keep on fighting the ship's shields are some of the best that starfleet can offer and it's a phenomenal defensive mechanism the shields on these ships are enormous so like i said this ship is a phenomenal ship in combat it has a lot of defenses it's also really good at commanding other ships. It makes a fantastic command ship for other fleets. The ship has the tools and the assets and the systems to keep communications going, block enemy communications. Its, e its ECM and ECCM abilities are second to none. The other thing about this is if you have a Galaxy-class starship, the reason I feel that it would be a poor idea to create a fleet would say a wing of just galaxy classes and nebulas is because those ships are so valuable that they can be used at the front line much more effective than just a hammer and anvil type weapon. So you could use them in the front lines, but they're going to get targeted and they're going to get targeted fast because the power projection that they're able to produce onto the battlefield is enormous and destroying this target would definitely be something that the enemy would want to do. So in order to keep that from happening, you would want to structure it around its own personal fleet. And so I want to show you what I think the Starfleet would do with the Galaxy classes when they were fighting the Dominion. All right, so I want to explain, before I show you the fleet dynamics of what I'm talking about, I want to explain why this is necessary. So... The Galaxy class and the Nebula class are one of the few ships that are using this state-of-the-art torpedo launching system. So this torpedo system is capable of launching and accelerating up to 10 torpedoes in a row. Most Federation starships are either single shot or newer generation ships are firing three to four torpedoes at max. Even the Defiant, which is said to be able to launch six, is still not even close to the amount of torpedoes that is coming out of this thing. So if you think about it from a military perspective, is the Galaxy class, what is it representing? It's long-range artillery. And we know how powerful artillery is in war. So you can stand literally behind the lines with your fleet, and you can just decimate the enemies. So much so that they can't stand there and fight with you on a torpedo barrage one for one. They can't. They have to come to you because you're outgunning them. This is the primary reason why the Galaxy classes and Nebulas would be such fantastic centerpieces for warfare. All right, so remember, think of this as the centerpiece to your fleet. It's a really powerful part, part of your fleet. Why is that? Well, it's the torpedo. So 1,710,000 points of damage is being delivered to your enemies at long distance. Now, once those enemies get into close, you're then being backed up by Type X phasers. Type X phasers, they're going to deliver a full volley of 910,000. That's really good. 
most ships are not coming anywhere close to the output of damage that things like this are. So this means that the Galaxy class is able to hit you at extremely long distance, and then at medium and short range, it's still very effective. Okay, so let's just kind of take a look at what I'm talking about. So we're going to be talking about a three-layer defense. Now, lots of different ships can be used in this different layering, but what I would think would be the best is you want really small, fast ships in the front. You want really strong ships in the middle area because they're the ones that are going to be taking the primary, the most amount of attack. Because most ships are going to fly by and try to get past the sabers, and they're going to go directly for your prime target, which is obviously our command ship. Now, if they get past the first two layers, we want to have some ships that are guarding the centerpiece. And we want them to be at least decent and good at fighting. So we want something that can stay there and can take a beating that's going to protect our really valuable Galaxy-class starship. And so it's a three-layer defense is what we're looking at. All right, so the blue line is representing our heavy hitters. Those are the ships that can take serious damage. They're going to do everything they can to protect the Galaxy class. And then that middle section is going to be one of the most dangerous sections. You're going to want really powerful new generation cruisers to be out there defending that because once ships get past the small Sabre classes, which is out in the front, your Mirandas, those ships are going to go down pretty quickly Yes, they're there more or less to slow the enemy down, but they're not going to stop the enemy. You're expecting the cruisers in the middle to stop the enemy, and if they can't, then we need something else backing them up. So the emergency ships are going to be your large capital-class ships. They're going to do most of the defense once the engagement has really occurred. All right, so let's kind of look at a different scenario. Let's say we're not in an engagement where we're having hundreds of ships and it's total chaos. Let's think about we're in a situation where we're dealing with 20 ships. Well, if that's the case, we would probably change the fleet dynamics just slightly. Um, I would move our really big, heavy-hitting, heavy cruisers up in the front line with our small attack ships. The reason for that is if we're really limited on the amount of ships that are attacking us and it's not complete and utter chaos, we don't want to lose our small ships right off the bat and then wait for you know, the cruisers to go do their job. We can then substitute the heavy cruisers, put them in the front lines, let them be that front line, get those kills, maybe put something lighter like an Excelsior in that mid-range where our cruisers were at, and they can put up a decent fight for ships to get past, and then obviously want to keep the big boys in the back protecting our assets. So we know due to the heavy losses that having the option to have new ships with Type 10 phaser arrays might not be something that you can do. So you might have to substitute those heavy cruisers for medium or light cruisers, so for an example, we have the Freedom and we have the Norway class. They're not particularly the greatest ship. They're using Type 8 phaser arrays and they're using Type 9 phaser arrays. Those are okay weapons, but you're going to have to substitute, unfortunately, with more ships in order to make up the lack of firepower because there's a huge difference between Type 9, Type 8, and then obviously Type 10. So when you have fleet dynamics like this, Instead of relying on more sophisticated ships, you're going to have to substitute with numbers. So this is kind of a fleet dynamic that you would use. You still want to keep at least some heavy ships behind the line to help the support. So the other thing to take in consideration is once our protective layers have been breached, then they still have to mess with the shielding of the Galaxy class and its overwhelming firepower. Anything that gets past those ships is going to be fighting for its life to try to do anything to a Galaxy class or even a Nebula. Since they're armed with Type 10 phaser emitters, they also have 360 degree firing arcs, especially with a Galaxy class. There's no spot you can go to on a Galaxy class where it can't attack you and defend itself. It's Type 9 phaser arrays. There's between 12 to 14 of them, depending on when the ship was created, and they're phenomenal. Now, the other thing to mention about a Galaxy class, besides it's working as a command ship and artillery, it is also transporting a huge amount of troops. 
So once the fighting is done and over with, not only are you a command vessel, artillery, but you're a troop transport. So that's one of the reasons why I'm saying this ship is so valuable to the fleet that putting it in the front lines just to go and smash the enemy target is something you should never do unless it's an emergency. So let's talk about the fatal mistake that took place during the Dominion War, which is the Sacrifice of Angels episode when they're attacking Kentaka or Kentaka, whatever the station, whatever it's called. Anyways, my whole point is, is you should never send valuable assets like galaxy classes or warbirds straight up in the front lines like this. Those ships are great long range artillery vessels, even a warbird can launch at least six torpedoes. So there's no reason that you should do this. And you're putting your really powerful, valuable assets at risk by sending them in there like that. It would have been much better to just send the small crap ships, you know, in the front, followed by stronger ships in the back with your heavy ships in the very back. Because those ships can soak up the torpedoes and firepower, and by the time that you're heading there and hitting the next wave, now you've got stronger ships in front of you, and now you can take those things out. And all you're losing are some of your smaller ships that are not as valuable to your fleet. Now, is that sad for the people who are in the Mirandas? Absolutely, but I would much rather lose a Miranda than lose a Galaxy class. I mean, there's no reason to risk ships like that. Now... I don't know why they did it the way that they did. It honestly seemed like really poor tactics to put your most valuable ship in the front line to get blasted. Now, I, the only thing that I could think of that they're thinking is that the Galaxy classes and the Warbirds can soak up so much more damage that it'll keep the smaller ships from being destroyed and they're worried about saving lives that way. And, and that's that's a somewhat of a good argument but then you're risking you're such a powerful good assets for things that are kind of trash and for me that doesn't seem like a very good idea there's a reason why you have recon there's a reason why you have certain fleet dynamics and that doesn't seem to be a very functional or operational fleet dynamic to me i personally think that you should have wings of smaller ships followed by some heavy cruisers you know, going into there and then protecting that asset. Because think of it this way. Every single time a Galaxy class fires its torpedoes, it's killing three Jem'Hadar ships and damaging a second one. So three are dead, one is damaged. Every single time this thing fires. Now, if it's attacking with, say, like a Jem'Hadar cruiser... Its shields are going to be just taken down, and it's going to take heavy damage. may not even be operational after that barrage. So there's so much opportunity for this ship to bring so much damage to the battlefield that even if you lose your first layers of ships, the amount of damage done to your enemy is so much more impactful on the battlefield than you sacrificing yourself to protect small assets. All right, so obviously commanders have different opinions. I want to show you my main reason that I believe that this asset is so important and I'm willing to sacrifice so many other starships just to protect this one starship. After I show you this, you can agree or disagree with me if what I'm saying is tactically sound or not. And I'll let you make that decision. But allow me to make the argument just for argument's sake. And here we go. All right, so here's my argument. A standard Galaxy class is equipped with around at least 250 photon torpedoes. If you take the average of 171,000 and you times it by 250, you're projecting 42,750,000 points of damage to the enemy fleet before you run out of torpedoes. That means that the Galaxy class, in the best case scenario, absolutely best case scenario, could kill 82 Jem'Hadar fighters by itself. Now, am I willing to give up an Akira for this? No. Am I willing to give up a Miranda or an Excelsior or a Steamrunner for this? 
Hell yes, I am. I would definitely give up those ships to kill 82 enemy craft. That's enormous. That is fantastic. All right, so we have talked about the dynamics of fleets and what they're looking like. We've talked about the front end ships, what ships are being used there, are being sacrificed. We've talked about the high, the high power output of fighters and the fighter fleets, and we've talked about the limited resources that the reserve fleet can bring to the battlefield. And now we've learned about the Galaxy class and its role. The Galaxy class should not be in the front lines. The ship is so valuable, it should be there just behind the front line, delivering artillery support. That is its most effective role. It is good at true transport. It is good at uh, using electric or electrical countermeasures or ECM. But its primary role for the Dominion War, in my opinion, is not a tank, but an artillery vessel. This is my thought process. This is my dynamics. If I was controlling Starfleet ships and I was a Starfleet Admiral, I would never put a Galaxy class in the front line. I would use it this way, as an artillery vessel. And the same thing with the Nebulas. Thank you for watching Trek Wars. If you like this material, please subscribe and make a comment. And with that being said, victory is life.